Link TV, connecting you to the world. Link TV is viewer supported. Watch more at linktv.org. Link TV presents Mosaic World News from the Middle East. Here are today's top stories. Jordan strips Jerusalem residents of citizenship rights. Bahrain opposition demands free and fair elections. And archaeologists discover priests' tomb near pyramids. Mosaic World News from the Middle East begins now. حذرت الحكومة الأردنية من مخاطر تزايد عدد المقدسيين المقيمين في الأردن الذين لا يجد. The Jordanian government has warned against the dangerous rise in the number of Jerusalemites residing in Jordan who don't renew their residency permits issued by the Israeli occupation. This prompted the government to change the Jerusalemites' permanent residency yellow cards to temporary green cards, stripping them of their basic rights. The Jordanian opposition said the citizenship order is unconstitutional. Hassan al Shubaki met a Jerusalemite family and reported on their ordeal. All members of his family have Jordanian citizenship except for him. This is how Nasir Abu Quaik, who was born in occupied Jerusalem, spent the first 17 years of his life. His name was added to his mother's Jerusalem residency card. Nearly 13 years ago, Nasir's mother was stripped of her Israeli residency card. In 2000, the Israeli occupation authorities forced Nasir to sign a document stripping him of his citizenship right. Six years later, Nasir married a Palestinian woman from the Gaza Strip and applied for a Jordanian-issued family record book. However, he was surprised to find out that his Jordanian citizenship had been revoked, as shown in this handwritten phrase. Nasir has diligently requested the occupation authorities grant him citizenship. Nasir also made several failed attempts to help uphold his Jordanian citizenship. His yellow card was changed to a green card, forfeiting all of his rights. When I look at the green card, I feel regret because I know I will lose all my rights, including health, education, political ownership and other rights. Overnight, I lost all of my rights. Yesterday, I was a Jordanian and today I'm a Palestinian. The Jordanian Ministry of Interior has recently expressed fear over the rise in the number of Jerusalemites residing in Jordan who don't renew their residency permits issued by the Israeli occupation. This causes them to risk losing their Palestinian residency cards and helps promote the concept of an alternate state, as confirmed by the government, which declined to return our call. In the long run, this means the number of people who would lose their citizenship will reach a million. They will not have the right to vote, work, receive Social Security benefits, own a car or open a bank account. Are these people or authorities aware of what they're doing? Several candidates running in the upcoming election declined to comment on the case. However, politicians and critics said implementing the articles of disengagement between the West and East Bank is leading to a rise in the number of yellow card holders, currently numbering a million, who are being described as victims of random orders and measures by the occupation authorities. As the government continues to change the residency status of Palestinians in Jordan, despite criticism by legal experts and political candidates, observers believe that Israel will continue to expel Palestinians from their land. Meanwhile, the suffering of Jerusalemites, as well as the suffering of Palestinians on both banks of the river, will continue. Hassan al Shubaki, Al Jazeera, Amman. A senior minister in Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu's government has threatened that his Labour Party would walk out of the coalition if peace talks with the Palestinians do not resume by the end of the year. Minorities at First Minister Avishai Bra Braverman, who intends to challenge Defence Minister Ehud Barak for Labour's leadership, said he would do everything he could to force the Labour Party out of the government. U.S. brokered peace negotiations, which began early last month, have been suspended as Netanyahu continues to resist international calls for extension of a partial freeze on settlement construction. Barack has, said, has so far resisted giving Netanyahu any ultimatum on the future of the Labour Party in his government. Labour holds 13 of the 71 seats that Netanyahu controls in the 120-member parliament. It, uh, its deflection could bring down the government led by his right-wing Likud party. 
Breverman proposed a four to five month freeze on settlements with minor exceptions supported by the Palestinians and the United States. Breverman also repeated his opposition to controversial legislation that would require Israeli citizens to pledge loyalty to Israel as a Jewish state. Israeli Arabs have criticized the measure as racists. Iraq's prime minister called for foreign companies to invest in his country, saying the security situation had improved significantly after years of conflict. On a visit to Cairo, Nouri al-Maliki said kidnappings and sporadic violence are still a problem in Iraq, but insisted the environment is safe for businesses to operate. Iraq is trying to shake off the legacy of years of violence, sanctions and economic decline by opening up its economy and luring foreign investment and expertise to help it rebuild. Sectors open for investment include construction engineering, petrochemicals and fertilizers to food, drugs and textiles. Al-Maliki spoke on the day Iraq auctioned off three major national gas fields to international companies, part of its strategy to open up the lucrative sector. International oil majors braved ongoing violence and political uncertainty to attend Iraq's third energy auction since the U.S.-led invasion, but Western companies either did not compete or failed to place the winning bids. Al-Maliki stressed that while investment in Iraq is needed, political interference is unwelcome. We want to call on friendly nations to stand by us. We need their support. We need their reforms. We need their opinions and we need their advice. But at the same time, we do not wish for anyone to interfere in the process of the formation of our government. But we want their support and for there to be a balanced, unbiased position among those who wish to be our partners. In Iraq, security forces carried enough the sight of a roadside bomb that some officials blamed on Shiite militants. The blast hit a convoy carrying up special envoy to Iraq, Ed Merkert, who was not hurt. But one policeman was killed and three others were injured. Police said the bomb damaged a vehicle in the UN Iraqi police convoy as it was leaving the Shiite holy city of al Najaf, south of Baghdad. A UN spokesperson in Baghdad confirmed the special representative was not hurt but could not speculate on the motive. An Iraqi police officer in al Najaf said initial investigation indicated the group al Haq was in involved in the attack because they always call for foreigners to be targeted. The group splintered from the Mahdi army of anti-American Shiite cleric Muqtada Sadr frequently claims credit for attacking U.S. forces and kidnapping foreign nationals. Melkert was in al Najaf for a visit to Grand Ayatollah Ali Sistani, Iraq's most revered Shiite cleric. After the meeting, Melkert urged Iraq political leaders to sit down and negotiate the formation of a coalition government without further delay seven months after an inclusive election yielded no outright winner. زعم جيش الاحتلال الأمريكي أن عدد القتل العراقيين في المدة من من بداية عام 2004. The U.S. occupation army claimed that the death toll of Iraqis from the beginning of 2004 to August of 2008 was around 77,000, in addition to about 122,000 wounded. The Washington Post newspaper said the figures that the U.S. army announced are lower than the numbers released by Nouri al-Maliki's government. An independent report indicates that Iraq lost 1.5 million of its people during the years of occupation. After reports indicated the existence of about a million widows and four million orphans in Iraq, there have been repeated requests to draw up a full strategy to find the right solution to the problems of widows and orphans in Iraq. These people are not only suffering from lack of material support and ways to earn a living, but are also subject to social problems. يتيم أو أرملة في كل منزل هدية الاحتلال الأمريكي للشعب العراقي بعد مرور أكثر من سبع سنوات على استباحته أراضي بلاد الرافدين
An orphan or widow in every household, this is the gift of the U.S. occupation to the Iraqi people since it invaded the country of two rivers seven years ago. These orphans and widows are neglected, and the government failed to solve this problem, which could create a threat to the solidity of Iraq's social structure. A number of reports indicated that the number of widows in Iraq has exceeded 2 million and the number of orphans reached 4 million. With the situation deteriorating, various institutions and organizations inside and outside Iraq have repeatedly requested to come up with a comprehensive strategy to find the best solution to the problem of widows and orphans. Social and educational experts stressed that the large number of widows and orphans are not only struggling with earning a living and making ends meet, but also suffering from social problems. The widows are mostly suffering from the low living standards and the deterioration of the economic situation in the country. Iraqi widows face having no source of income after they lose the breadwinner of the house. The consequences of this problem make it necessary to remove the dividing line between society and politics. Experts requested to speed up the process of forming the next government, affirming the importance of including the situation of widows and orphans as a top priority on the agenda of the next government in order to support this social stratum. They warned that the widows and orphans may slip into what they called the dark corners of the society, which may cause more trouble for Iraq. The experts reiterated that making an official strategy to help the widows in Iraq to solve their problems is not something difficult to do. They said that the government's failure to implement such a strategy and its shirking the responsibility for this problem increases the suffering of these widows and orphans. Another news, a funeral for the victims of violence in the Pakistani city of Karachi has turned into an anti-government protest rally. Mourners shouted anti-government slogans during the mass funeral for the victims of what's called political violence. Shops and schools closed and public transport suspended in Karachi with security forces deployed to troubled areas. Tensions have been running high in Pakistan's biggest city. More than 70 people, including political activists, have been killed in recent days. Karachi is Pakistan's economic capital. The port city is the main route for NATO supplies for the U.S.-led war in Afghanistan. An explosion in western Afghanistan has killed at least 10 civilians. Most of the dead are women and children. Now, Afghan police say the incident occurred after a civilian bus hit a Taliban-style roadside bomb in Herat. The bomb was supposedly planted to target military forces. Now, violence has recently spread from Afghanistan south to its northern and western areas, despite the presence of some 150,000 foreign troops. The United Nations says more than 1,200 civilians have been killed in the first half of 2010. Another news from Afghanistan, the election, independent election commission there has announced almost a quarter of the votes that were casted in the country's parliamentary polls are invalid. The commission says it has tossed out 1.3 million of the total of 5.6 million votes because of fraud. That means about 23 percent of the votes have been disqualified. The UN-backed Electoral Complaints Commission has also said it has received more than 4,000 complaints. This could put off the release of final results by weeks. Since the election took place on September 18th, there have been reports of underage voting and the use of fake voter cards. More than 2,500 candidates stood for the 249 seats up for grabs in the parliament's lower house. Turnout was pretty low at just above 40 percent and attacks on election day left around two dozen people dead.
أصدرت محكمة بريطانية اليوم حكما بالسجن المؤبد على الأمير السعودي سعود بن عبد العزيز. A British court sentenced Saudi Prince Saud Abdulaziz to life in jail after finding him guilty of murdering an aide in London in February of this year. It was revealed that the murder occurred after the prince abused his aide a number of times for fun. Testimonies revealed that the victim, a Saudi national as well, by the name of Bandar Abdulaziz, was assaulted before being killed. كان في حالة من الوهن حين تعرض للقتل أكد وزير الأمن الإيراني حيدر مصلحي أن الأمريكيين المعتقلين بتهمة الدخول غير Intelligence Minister Haider Moslehi confirmed the trial of the detained Americans charged with illegal entry into Iranian territory and espionage. Moslehi said his ministry will present all documents in its possession to the respective judicial body. He did not disclose the date of the trial, but the defense lawyer for the two charged men, Josh Fatal and Shane Bauer, indicated that the trial will start on November 6th. الثاني طالبت قوى سياسية بحرينية سلطات في البلاد بتوفير ضمانات بنزاهة العملية Political blocks in Bahrain have demanded that authorities secure guarantees for fair parliamentary elections set to take place in three days. Al-Wifaq National Islamic Society sent a list of seven demands to the High Election Commission, including a call to cancel public voting centers and appoint a monitor for each candidate as mandated by the Constitution. Amidst political polarizations over the impartiality of the Bahraini elections, Al-Wifaq National Islamic Society submitted a list of demands to the High Election Commission calling for fair and transparent elections. Among the demands is a call to cancel public voting centers and limit voting to specific centers assigned to each electoral district. In addition, Al-Wifaq called for the appointment of a monitor for each candidate as mandated by the Constitution. This is to help combat the illegal use of political funds, part of which may be misused by groups affiliated with the executive authorities. We also want to guarantee the neutrality of the armed services in the election process. We heard that some military personnel are being directed to vote for candidates competing against the opposition. رسالة الوفاق جاءت ردا على تصريحات أدلى بها رئيس اللجنة العليا الشيخ خالد بن عبد الله آل خليفة ووعد فيها بإقناع المواطن البحريني Al Wifaq's letter was in response to a statement issued by the head of the High Election Commission, Sheikh Khalid bin Abdullah Al Khalifa, who called on Bahraini citizens to help safeguard the integrity and transparency of the elections. Despite its small area and population, Bahrain has witnessed waves of political conflict since the dissolution of parliament in 1973. عرف بالإصلاحات الملكية آنذاك ظن الكثيرون بأن الأزمة السياسية التي تعصف بالبلاد قد In 2002 the parliament was reinstated following the so-called royal reforms. At that time many believed the political storm would level off. To their surprise the political crisis gained momentum following a number of constitutional amendments pertaining to the Shura Council which the opposition claims took away some parliamentary privileges. With the elections approaching competition between the candidates has intensified. The population of the Kingdom of Bahrain stands at two million, distributed over five provinces. The number of election centers in each province ranges between six and nine, with each province designated 40 parliamentary seats and 40 municipal. The opposition rejected this distribution, describing it as sectarian. Critics are saying that the division is not fair because some sects will not be able to fairly compete for half of the parliamentary seats. إذ لا يمكن لبعض الطوائف الحصول على نصف المقاعد النيابية فضلا In addition, people are criticizing the so-called political citizenship law, which continues to spark political polarization and debate, with some raising questions about its ramifications on the current elections. The president of Turkey's Board of Higher Education has decided to allow veiled students to take university entrance exams without exception. In a previous decision, the board had warned university officials against regulating the student's style of clothing. This comes as Turkey is still debating how to resolve the headscarf issue at universities.
Ministers of the ruling Justice and Development Party held meetings with opposition parties in order to reach a compromise on the headscarf issue. The consultations began with ministers from the main opposition party, the Republican People's Party, who refused the ruling party's offer to establish a special commission, which would be composed of representatives of all parties in parliament to solve the issue. Everyone realized the ruling party has a hidden agenda, and we tested it during today's meeting. And while the other two opposition parties, the Nationalist Movement and the Peace and Democracy Party, wished to solve the issue, they both renewed their conditions to the ruling party. We will announce our final position after we look into what the Justice and Development Party will announce after meeting with the political parties in Parliament. We told the representative of the ruling party that the issue should be considered as part of a larger package within the frame of freedom of religion. While political parties look for a compromise on the headscarf issue, the Board of Higher Education issued a new decision that would facilitate the entry of veiled students to universities. The board president's decision would allow veiled students to take entrance exams and photos of veiled students to be used for official documents. Yes, we decided to allow our veiled girls to take all entrance exams at universities without any exception or condition. Following consultations between political parties to resolve the issue at universities, the Republican Public Prosecution, one of Ataturk's forts of secularism, issued a statement that has been described as provocative, stating that the freedom to wear a headscarf contradicts the principle of secularism and the regulations of the European Court of Human Rights. In the political party's first meeting, a solution on the headscarf issue was not reached. However, observers believe that despite the obstacles, the issue will be resolved sooner or later, seeing that the country has a conservative majority. From Istanbul, Abdul Nasser Singhi, BBC. Mosaics embody the fusion of the soul, the mind, and culture. In turn, they recount the stories of our ancestors. National experts discovered one of these artworks in the region of Tel Ahmar in southern Aleppo. The history of this mosaic can be traced back to the 9th century BC. Mosaic art is one of the most creative old oriental arts. It derives from ancient arts in the Mediterranean and the country of the two rivers. Mosaics consist of pieces of stone that are collected and joined together. The ancient civilization in northern Syria was known for its mosaic art. This art expresses the fusion of the soul, the mind, and the culture. In the beginning, it was made from rocks, seashells, and stones. Then, marble pieces were used as well to create pieces of work that recount the stories of our forefathers, such as this panel. This piece of art was discovered by local experts in Til Akhma, which is located about 180 kilometers north of Aleppo. Its history can be traced back to the 9th century BC. This is a unique piece of work, a one of a kind. This is not the first time that mosaic art was discovered. There have been several others before this piece. There was a Turkish piece and another one in Iraq. But for us, this is the first time that we discovered and restored this art piece with our national experts, without any help from the Italians or any other foreign experts. The most beautiful aspect of this piece is that it is made of cobblestones. Residents close to the Euphrates River had easy 
easy access to cobblestones, pebbles, and other river rocks, so they took advantage of it. So it is made out of the black and white cobblestones, and it was discovered in the palace of Ashuri. Historic discoveries emerged to tell us a small chapter of the long story entitled Syria, proving to the world that our country is the cradle of civilization. Water al Mali, Syria TV from the National Museum of Aleppo. The Secretary General of Egypt's Supreme Council of Antiquities, Dr. Zayi Hawass, announced the discovery of an ancient tomb near the Great Pyramids of Giza. It holds the body of a high priest who lived during King Hafra's era. It is the first tomb of a non-laborer to be unearthed and is expected to lead to similar tombs near the pyramids. This area will continue to unveil the secrets behind the majesty and genius of ancient Egyptians. After discovering the tombs of laborers, the Egyptian delegation uncovered an ancient tomb near the pyramids today. The tomb is the first of its kind and belongs to a major religious figure who held a number of prominent positions during the era of King Khafra. Rijka served as a priest for King Hafra and as a priest of his pyramid. He was also the purification inspector. For this reason, these tombs could not have been used for laborers. I believe that the construction of the site began at the end of the 5th or 6th dynasty, when the western tomb, located west of King Khufu's pyramid, was narrowed. The architectural planning of the discovered tomb, which is located south of the laborers' tombs, combines the style of tombs carved in stone and those built as a part of the stone. Most importantly, it indicates the status of Ruj Ka in that he was capable of producing a tomb of this magnitude. It is approximately 12 by 12 meters. Part of it was carved in stone, and the other part was built with stone. We're very happy to have discovered this tomb. It is a way for the world to become acquainted with our civilization, Egypt's civilization. Inside the tomb, a number of colored inscriptions were found. They represent the owner of the tomb and his wife. An offering table lies between them in this scene. In addition, there are scenes depicting daily life, such as animals grazing and milking cows. These scenes indicate that the tomb could be from the end of the 5th dynasty or the beginning of the 6th dynasty, because such scenes really started to appear at the end of the 5th dynasty. The door holds all their titles. How beautiful is this tomb that greatly differs from others discovered near the pyramids. It could be the beginning of a journey to find other tombs that belong to the non-laboring class. Isam El Tigi, Nile TV. The views expressed on Mosaic are from contributing broadcasters, not Link TV or its sponsors. The production of Mosaic is made possible from support of viewers like you. Thank you. Watch Mosaic World News online, stay up to date with breaking news, read our blog, get transcripts of past shows and more at linktv.org slash mosaic. This program is brought to you by Link TV for educational and non commercial use only. Link TV is the only U.S. network dedicated to global and national news, uncompromising documentaries, and diverse cultural programs, programs which connect you to the world.